Good day everyone! A lot of new nurses, local or foreign nurses, are being assigned to the COVID units nowadays here in the United States. And in order for me to help you guys adjust better, I'm gonna give you a crash course on how we take care of COVID patients here in the US, including the treatments as well as the nursing considerations you have to know, which are all based on my personal experience. So stay tuned and watch today. I'm Nurse Juan de la Cruz, your OFW. First, we start with the basic assessment. Of course, like the signs and symptoms of COVID, I think you have heard this multiple times. Uh, like for the flu-like symptoms, cough, cold, headaches, uh, body aches, fever, uh, diarrhea, weakness. So mostly those are the most common typical things you hear about the COVID for the mild symptoms. Then the other symptoms, which is really unique for the COVID, which is the loss of taste and loss of smell. These things can develop even later on in the stage. Like for my wife, it developed 10 days after she initially had some of the COVID symptoms. But it lasted around 5 days only. Uh, for some other patients, it will last longer and even sometimes reaches around few months before it completely resolves or partially resolves. Then next is fainting spells. This is based on my personal experience and then I have a number of patients who had similar issues wherein they fainted and fell at home. So nursing consideration here is always safety, uh, full precaution. So make sure the bed alarm is always turned on for these kind of patients, especially in those early days of the COVID wherein they're really feeling weak. I always remind my patients to press the call button when they need to step out of the bed. And I will tell them that uh, since you're weak, you might possibly fall and might further prolong your stay and worsen your condition if ever that happens. So that's the normal thing I usually tell them. It's not because I wanted to scare them, but it's a possible reality. It is. So I just wanted them to know for the possible risk. Then, the most typical type of COVID patients you'll be taking care in the hospital setting or for the inpatient settings are those with the pneumonia-like symptoms, wherein like they have a shortness of breath, they have a low oxygen saturation, they have a more severe type of cough, wherein when they cough, it feels like it's hurting, especially when they take a deep breath. Usually, it starts as a dry cough, then in a matter of days, it converts into a more productive type of cough. Then, as a nurse here, it is your responsibility to listen or auscultate your patient's lung sounds. Initially, for these COVID patients, you will definitely hear a decreased breath sounds, uh, particularly on the basis of the lungs. Then, as days progresses, uh, it develops into a coarse crackles, mostly heard on the bilateral basis as well. And if it worsens, most of the time, the decreased breath sound spreads for the entire lung field. While the crackles for the severe type of patients, uh, you, you won't only hear them on the basis. Sometimes you can hear them even on the middle part of the lobes or the lung fields. Using or knowing how to use a stethoscope here in the U.S. is really part of your nursing responsibility. And it is a really essential thing to have here as a nurse. Because in some cases, you will be asked by some of the doctors to the phone what the lung sound is for that particular patient or what can you ask will take. Then that doctor will determine his management based on your particular assessment, based on your own assessment. For me, this is one of the biggest difference between the nursing practice in the Philippines or Singapore versus in the U.S. Your assessment skills really matters here in the U.S. That's why I made a video tutorial about lung auscultations to help you gain and practice the skills even before coming to the United States. So make sure to watch that as well if you still don't know how to do it. The next is the diagnostics part. First is the swab test. Swab tests are usually done by the nurses from the ER or clinic nurses. The rapid swab test result will be available within 2-3 to three hours, but it is not available for everyone. Normally, you have to get permission in order to do that particular test. Mm -hmm. Then for the regular swab test, it normally takes around 1-3 to three days before the results comes out. In my particular department, we normally use a nasal swab test. I haven't experienced doing the oropharyngeal test yet until now. Patients on non-COVID floors who were exposed to patients or relatives who came to visit that turns out to be COVID positive will be swapped after 5 to 10 days after the initial exposure. So while waiting, they'll be tagged as PUI and they will be monitored throughout those days. Then the next test is the most basic one, which is the chest x-ray. Normally for COVID patients with more severe symptoms or shortness of breath, the results will show like a ground glass opacities or like a pneumonia. So in other words, like a COVID pneumonia. Then these things are usually seen on the basis of the lungs, especially those who just started having their symptoms. Then for the lab results, normally the D-dimer is the one really elevated. So meaning there's a possibility of clot formation because D-dimer is a fragment when a clot dissolves. So if a patient came in because of shortness of breath, then has an elevated D-dimer, 
And doctors will definitely look at it as a possible pulmonary embolism or PE. Then the next procedure, which is most likely will be ordered, will be the CT scan of the chest to rule out the pulmonary embolism. Nursing considerations for the CT scan. Normally, they will ask you to have an IV inserted uh, above the forearm. So this is your forearm. So above or something higher from here. And they want it to be like gauge 20 at least. So practice IV insertion from here onwards. Unlike in the Philippines, you normally insert everything on their hands if possible. Here in the US, you can see a lot of them inserting here above, particularly on the antecubitical area. This is a really common practice here in the US. Most of the time, the initial result for the CT scan will be negative for the PE. Also for the lab tests, we noted that the ferritin levels are usually high as well. The next will be the most exciting part, which is the treatment. The number one drug of choice for COVID patients here in the US with short of breath symptoms will be the Remdesivir, the antiviral medication. Remdesivir is usually give like a 100 milligram in a 250 ml normal saline bag, which we run for two hours. We normally give this for five doses, so one dose per day. At the start of the pandemic, usually we give this to every COVID patient that turns out to be positive. But now, because I think there's a scarcity of this medication, we only give them for selected patients, particularly those who have symptoms for the shortness of breath or requires oxygen supplementation. But the downside here is, based on my personal observations, some patients will develop shortness of breath one week after the initial symptoms. So it's sometimes best just to give the Rendesivir from the start. Another thing with the Rendesivir, it really slows your heart. Most of the time, I can see most of my patients will have a heart rate from 40s to 50s, especially if they're sleeping, which is really not their typical heart rate. I even have some patients who were really tachycardic, but after receiving the Rendesivir, their heart rate became like uh, bradycardic. But most of them are asymptomatic. So nursing consideration here is watch out for the heart rate and do not give any other further beta blockers or any medications that can slow the heart further. Then in some instances, Rendesivir can really mess with your heart rhythm. It sometimes produces different heart rhythms like atrial fibrillations, atrial flutter, but it really happens. And that's why most of our patients who are receiving the Rendesivir will be placed on the telemetry monitoring. They will be hooked with this small machine which will be attached to them with three leads uh, for the entire duration they're in the hospital. And we will be monitoring them through our main monitor through the station. And also, in order for you to get that particular medication or request a particular medication for that patient, you have to get a hard copy of the positive COVID results. If the positive COVID swab test was not done in your facility, you, we normally have to call that particular uh, clinic or particular facility in order for them to fax us the result for us to request the Rendesivir from our pharmacy. That's how strict they are with regards to giving off Rendesivir to any patients. Then often, they will also order azithromycin IV. Usually, it's a 500 milligram, which is placed inside a 250 ml bag. A nursing consideration here. Azithromycin tend to be irritating on the veins, so please run it a bit slower. Normally, we here they ask us to slow like 1 hour and 13 minutes, but sometimes, even with that particular time frame, it still burns. So, if you could run it a bit slower and observe for possible phlebitis, because that's one of the major complaints of my patients receiving this particular antibiotic. Then the next is Lovenox or Enoxaparin to prevent clot formations because of serious complications for COVID has something to do with the class. So definitely, we want to do something to prevent that from happening. Computation for this particular medication is usually 0.75 milligram per kilogram. So normally, you give subcutaneously around 70 to 80 milligram normally. That's a usual uh, dose we give to those patients. And we usually give it twice a day. Nursing considerations. You have to take note on other medications that your patient is taking, particularly if your patient is taking other medications that helps prevent clots, like Sarelto or Warfarin. You have to inform your physician about this. And the next is the most common one, which is the dexamethasone or the corticosteroid. Another name for this is Decadron here in the US. So usually we give around 4 to 6 milligram per dose, and normally we start with every 6 hours. Then we taper based on their progression for their particular symptoms. One thing about dexamethasone is it, it really increases your blood sugar. If your patient is diabetic, the blood sugar levels will definitely be high. So most of the time, our doctors will order some short-acting insulins like Humalog. And we normally use a sliding scale. We use this like uh, pre-meals and before bedtime. So nursing consideration here, watch out for hypoglycemia. 
especially for those patients who do not have their appetite back yet. Then, another thing to consider for the dexamethasone is for the blood pressure. Steroid can make your blood pressure higher. You definitely have to check and make sure that your blood pressure is below 170 or 160 before administering this steroid dose. The next will be the supplements or the vitamins, like the vitamin B complex, the thiamine, the vitamin D. Vitamin D recently, i seen a video wherein they're correlating the low levels of vitamin D to those patients having more severe symptoms for the COVID. So it's a really nice video and really informative. I'll put in the link below for you guys to watch it as well. Then also we're giving also zinc sulfates. Then quercetin. Quercetin is like an anti-inflammatory medications as well has something to, to help for the immunity. Then the next is to control some of the symptoms. Like for the fever, we give acetaminophen or Tylenol. Normally, we give 650 mg every 4 to 6 hours for fever or for pain. Then for the cough or the phlegm, we give mucinex. It's usually 600 to 1,200 mg twice a day. Then breathing treatments. We don't give nebulized treatments on our particular patients because this can help spread the virus throughout the room. Instead, we give a meter dose inhaler for the albuterol. Normally, we give two puffs every four hours as needed. It is best to use a space chamber, especially for those patients who have difficulty taking a deep breath. This will definitely help them to get the full dose of that particular inhaler. One nursing consideration for here is to watch out for their heart rate. Albuterol can definitely increase your heart rate. So if your patient has like a tachycardic or AFib around 100 or 110, so make sure to ask the doctor first before giving this medication or to ask a doctor for any alternative for this particular medicine, especially if your patient is having difficulty breathing. Then IV fluids. Normally, we don't give IV fluids for patients unless they have like electrolyte imbalance or we only give if the patient has like acute kidney injury. But most of the time, we don't give them fluids. Uh, they will be on saline lock only. The next is the convalescent plasma. Uh, we give this once only. So for the blood transfusion process, it normally takes around 30 minutes to one hour. Uh, for me, the only thing I need to worry about here is having congestion, especially for those patients who have congestive heart failure. And here in the US, there's a lot of patients who have history of congestive heart failure, wherein if you give too much fluids or you give fluids too rapidly, it can lead to having uh, respiratory distress. So that's one of the things we have to really watch out for taking care of patients with CHF. Then for the treatment for the non-medication part, we use an incentive spirometry. This is a tool for them to help expand their lungs or to help their lungs exercise from time to time. Uh, normally, when you ask the patients to do this initially, they will definitely cough and really verbalize that they have like a feeling shortness of breath or that it hurts to do like a deep breath. But it normally improves after a few days. Then if you listen to their lung fields, it's usually a diminished lung sounds because they really can't expand their lungs well enough, unlike before or before the COVID time. Normally, the initial level that they'd be able to push out will be around 500 to 750 most of the time. And if they progress better, if the treatment is working, you can see the progress going up. They can even reach to around 2,500 for some of my patients. It's really nice to witness patients having this kind of progress. Normally, we ask them to do this like 10 to 15 times. And we ask them to repeat this every one to two hours. Then the oxygen saturation normally increases when they do this, except for patients with a history of COPD, wherein when they do this particular exercise, the oxygen saturation normally drops. But if the patient is asymptomatic and doesn't have any distress, just leave it. Normally, that's okay. Give it 15 to 30 minutes, their oxygen level normally picks up. Then next is for the oxygen treatment. Normally, we start with the nasal cannula. Usually use it from 2 to 5 liters per minute. We're the ones usually titrating. We don't need to have an order for it. As long as we maintain about 90 to 92 percent. That's usually our main goal. Then if the oxygen saturation is still below 90 percent on the 5 liters nasal cannula, what we do is we switch to a high flow nasal cannula. Wherein the maximum for this is 15 liters. It is typically the same with the nasal cannula but it can deliver more oxygen up to 15 liters. Then same thing, we titrate accordingly as long as we reach the 90, the minimum 90 goal. Then if the patient still has a low oxygen saturation, even with the 15 liters of the high flow nasal cannula, then we go for the non-rebreather mask. Normally, we only use this temporarily if possible. Uh, nowadays, we do have a new device 
or hindi ko ulit vapotherm. It is similar to the high flow nasal cannula but it delivers a more humidified and warm vapor. Ventimas, we don't really use Ventimas as often. Normally, it's high flow nasal cannula, then Vapotherm. That's usually our both transition. We skip the Ventimas most of the time. Then, if it's still not working, the next option is to use a BiPAP machine. BiPAP is normally used for patients with the COPD, but it also works for those COVID patients just to help to maintain their oxygen level at the minimum level desired. Then, if it still doesn't work, then the only option is to intubate the patient. And normally, once the patients are intubated, we don't keep them on the COVID floors. We have to transfer them to the ICU units. The next is the complications for the COVID. Usually, it is an acute respiratory failure or it has something to do with the clots. Clots were in like patient has suddenly developed stroke. When I say stroke, it's like a brain stroke, meaning there's a sudden weakness on one side, slurring of speech, uh, confusion. So that's one of the things you have to watch out for these particular patients. And also, patients who having sudden chest pain or MI, more sudden difficulty breathing, like a pulmonary embolism. So these are the major complications that you will definitely experience if you're taking care of COVID patients. Then the next thing is the issues with concerns for taking care of COVID patients. Number one is the supply for the PPE. Some days we are still running short for supplies for the PPE. So sometimes we do have to ration them from time to time. But it doesn't happen as much as often as it happened before. Also, some of the PPEs we have are not really like a quality type of PPEs. Really. Normally, we use a disposable type of gowns. Some of these gowns are really like a really thin type, really in poor quality, which really raises the questions if it really protects you or not. Since there's a surge in COVID cases here in Kentucky, the main issue is beds. Like I told you in my previous video, our main capacity in my previous unit was only like six patients for COVID patients. And when we have to widen our COVID unit, now we're catering around 16 to 18 patients maximum. But sometimes those rooms are still not enough. At the start of the pandemic, we're normally doing one to three total care. But now we're doing like one to four to five patients. Then another issue is no ICU beds. There are instances wherein we have emergency cases in our particular uh, COVID floor wherein we really need to transfer the patient to the emergency room or the ICU setup, but there's no room. So what we do is we try to communicate other hospitals in order for them to accept some of our patients, but they are in the same situation as us. So it really takes time for us to be able to find a particular room or a particular place for them to transfer. And in most cases, it will take like one or two days before we are able to find a particular place for them to transfer. So instead of getting the quality care that they serve or higher level standard of care, they're stuck in a particular hospital with a particular treatment where he leaves the patient at jeopardy for his life because uh, the treatment we're giving is not working and he or she needs a better one. But since there's no vacant, there's no place for him to transfer, we really don't have any choice. Ending, patient can die or stick with that particular care. Hope you guys learned something from this video. Again, this is based on my own personal experience and knowledge for working in a COVID unit on a medical surgical uh, setup. If you feel like I miss out something or you have any information or things to do differently in a particular area that could be helpful for anyone, please comment it down below. Let's share the knowledge in order for us to have a better treatment on taking care of these COVID patients. So in my next video, in order to help those possible future COVID nurses, I will share to you my routine and practices working in a COVID unit. So please, Press the like button and click on the subscribe button and share it to your friends and relatives. Again, I'm Nurse Juan de la Cruz, your OFW nurse. Thank you for watching. God bless. Bye-bye. Stay safe.